Hello, welcome to the APC question debrief. This is a debrief of question one from specimen paper one on the ACCA website for SBR. I think it's just called specimen paper, actually. There's specimen paper and specimen paper two. This is specimen paper one, question one. I'm going to start by sort of planning an answer, then we'll have a look at an answer that I have actually written. First of all, we'll go to the requirement. So this is 30 mark question in this particular case. Probably won't be longer than 30, but it could be 25 sometimes. And notice that in all of the cases here, A1, A2 and A3, it says explain with suitable workings, explain with suitable calculations, discuss with suitable workings. So in all three cases here, we need to write about what should be done and actually do it. And then we've also got an advise on the difference between equity and liability. So that's some technical knowledge and then advise on whether or not proposed accounting treatment have been done correctly. Presumably it's something to do with equity and liability. Let's have a look in a tiny little bit more detail at the requirement then here, all of them. I'm going to go through A1 and then show you an answer for A1 and then do A2, show you an answer for A2, A3, show you an answer for A3 and so on and do it that way, as opposed to go through everything and then show an answer for the whole thing. So this is explain with suitable calculations how goodwill should be calculated for two companies here, two different goodwill calculations. And seeing as it says to correct any errors by the finance director, the chances are that somebody has had an attempt at calculating goodwill and they've not done it particularly well and they've not done it correctly. The same thing would appear to apply to the A2, which is how the gain or loss should have been recorded in the group financial statement. So the majority of this is group stuff. But then looking at A3, A3 is not necessarily to do with groups. It happens to be here. But pensions is a single company standard, isn't it? how the pension scheme should be dealt with after a restructuring has occurred and whether a provision for restructuring should be made. And then B, difference between equity and liability, proposed accounting treatment of a contingent payment. So those are the things that we have to do. Right, let's concentrate on A1 to start with. So in order to answer A1, we need to read from the top of the question all the way down page three, but only to there on page four. So we'll look at that first, sort ourselves an answer out for that, and then have a look at A2, A3 and B. So bearing in mind, we're looking for goodwill information here, aren't we? And it looks a bit strange this, doesn't it? Because on the actual statement of financial position that we have at the moment, there is no goodwill. There is actually. It's just that it has been calculated as negative goodwill, which doesn't go as an asset on the statement of financial position. It gets written off as a bargain purchase. So it's been calculated as negative goodwill. We've just got to decide whether or not that's correct. And remember there are two goodwill calculations, one for house and one for Mac. Looking at house, 70% acquisition, which means a 30% non-controlling interest. Purchase consideration was made up of 20 million $1 shares. And then we've got potentially 5 million more at a slightly later date. And I'm just writing next to those contingent. That's contingent consideration because the issue of those shares depends upon whether or not the company is going to make a profit. The market price of the parent company shares are $2. Okay, so that means that the market value of the 20 million shares is $40 million. Gives you the market price of a subsidiary share as well. Well, that would be useful for calculating the subsidiary, the, the, the non-controlling interest, won't it, for the subsidiary shares. But it also tells us, just towards the end of the second paragraph, it is felt there's a 20% chance of the profit target being met. So that means if we're going to measure this contingent consideration, it's not going to be the full amount of 5 million. It's going to be 20% of 5 million, which is actually 1 million shares. And we know the fair value of those shares, $2. 
So if we are going to measure that contingent consideration, that's going to be at 2 million and it should be included. You should include contingent consideration at fair value. And the fair value here will be 20% of the shares times the value. Also tells us the directors did not take account of the non-controlling interest in the goodwill calculation. Well, that's wrong as well, isn't it? You should take into account non-controlling interest. The director determined that there was a bargain purchase of eight because what they've done is they've gone 40 million cost of investment there minus the net assets at the date of acquisition, which was 48 million, gives you minus eight for your goodwill calculation. So that's what they've done. Well, that's not right for a couple of reasons. For one, they've not included the contingent consideration in the cost of investment, and two, they haven't included a non-controlling interest value. We've got enough information to work out the non-controlling interest value because we know that there are 13 million shares in-house, a little bit lower down. So all we need to do is take that 13 million, multiply it by the minority percentage, which is 30%, and then we can use the value of a share in-house, which is $4.2 million, uh, $4.2, dollars, sorry, there, $4.20, so we can actually work out the value of the non-controlling interest. I've done it in the answer, I'll do the full calculation when we get there. There are two goodwill calculations to do as far as A1 is concerned. So initial calculation for, for MAC is an 80% acquisition, so there is a 20% non-controlling interest. Privately owned company, that means that measuring the non-controlling interest might be a little bit more difficult to do because there's no readily attainable market value, is there? So perhaps they should be using a valuation basis based on an equivalent type of company, which is actually what they've done. Cash consideration is 52 and also there is land as consideration. So the total consideration is 57. Carrying value of the land is only three and really should be fair value of five. The net assets at the date of acquisition are 55 and Matt made a profit of 3.6 million, which it tells us. Working on down a little bit further, the directors of Kitchen wish to measure non-controlling interest at fair value at the date of acquisition, but have again missed out the non-controlling interest from the goodwill calculation, so they haven't put it in. The non-controlling interest is to be fair valued, but it can't be using the share price, it's using a method which is called the market multiple method. Let's have a look and see what that is. How reasonable does this sound? The directors of Kitchen have identified two companies who are comparable to Mac and who are trading at an average price earnings ratio of 21. The directors have adjusted that PE ratio to 19 for differences, which sounds reasonable, and then wish to, make, to value the non-controlling interest based on that. Finance director has determined that a bargain purchase of 3 million arose because what they've done, if they've gone cash consideration of 52, minus the value of the net assets of 55, gives minus three. Okay, well that's not right either, is it? In the same way that in the first one, 40 minus 48 gives minus eight is not right because the cost of investment was wrong and the non-controlling interest wasn't included. Well, as far as this one is concerned, again, the cost of investment is wrong. It shouldn't be 52, it should be 57. And the non-controlling interest is not included. So that's as far as we need to go through the question information in order to be able to answer A1. So let's have a look at my answer to A1. And remember here, all of this, I'll go through it in a minute, all of that there, in that big square bracket is worth 10 marks and 10 marks only. I've started with a revised goodwill calculation. So my revised goodwill calculation is cost of investment of 40 plus the two contingent um, consideration value, which are justified underneath. Non-controlling interest I've calculated as 16.38. Net assets are actually as per the question. So we haven't had to change those. And then the goodwill is gonna to go to the statement of financial position. So I've started with the revised goodwill calculation. You could start with the adjustments you're going to make if you like, but I've just decided to start that. So 
IFRS 3 requires contingent consideration to be measured at fair value. If you can't remember that it's IFRS 3, you could just miss out the first couple of words there and just say contingent consideration should be measured at fair value. This was not done in the original calculation, but 2 million has now been added to the cost of investment. Non-controlling interest has also been added using the fair value, and I've done the, the calculation there. Okay, 13 million number of subsidiary shares times 0.3, which is the 30% minority share, times 4.2, $4.20 per share, that's the value of a subsidiary share to give you 16.38 million. And then there's no adjustment to the fair value of the net assets. Don't need to make an adjustment there at all. The journal adjustment would be put the 10.38 million in as goodwill and that would go on the SFP. We are debiting the SPNL. We are removing the negative goodwill. We're removing the bargain purchase. It's not a bargain purchase, is it? It's not negative goodwill. We're putting in the statement of financial position, non-controlling interest, and we are adding in as well the contingent consideration. And the contingent consideration is going to increase the cost of investment, which we've done. And the other side of the entry is a credit on the SFP. It's going to have to go to other component of equity, as I've said down here because it's actually shares that are going to get issued. It's not a liability, is it? It's, a, it's an equity transaction. And then I've just explained what I've done. The incorrect bargain purchase has been removed, replaced with positive goodwill. NCI is added to the group SFP. Contingent, contingent consideration goes to other components of equity. It doesn't make any difference whether you do your explanation and then do the calculation or whether you do the calculation and then explain what you've just done. You can do it whichever way around you like. Moving on to the goodwill on Mac, the second goodwill calculation. Again, I've done the revised goodwill calculation. The CI, the controlling interest, is the cash plus the PPE that's being exchanged, which is 5 million. The non-controlling interest is calculated below. We'll have a look at that in a minute. The net assets fair value is as per the question, so there's no actual adjustment for that at all. And then I've explained what I've done. The fair value of the land of 5 million is um, part of the cost of investment as a, and has been added in up here. The NCI has once been, again been included at fair value, but this time it's not based on the share price because there isn't a share price. It's based on the PE ratio. And the PE ratio is 19. So we've got 19 lots of profit. The profit was 3.6 multiplied by 19. So if you just work out that bit there, that gives you 68.4 million. But then we multiply that by the NCI percentage, don't we, which is the 20% given in the question. So our non-controlling interest is 13.68. Journal adjustment is required. Goodwill is going on the SFP. We are removing the negative goodwill. We're removing the, removing the bargain purchase. So that's coming out the statement to profit and loss. We're including and recognising the SFP non-controlling interest of 13.68. And we are taking out the fair value of the property, plant and equipment from the stem to financial position. And I've explained how and why underneath. The incorrect bargain, bargain purchase has been replaced with the positive goodwill figure. The NCI is now included on the SFP. PPE has been reduced by the land now given as part of the acquisition. It doesn't belong to the group anymore. Okay, so that would do as far as the first part of A is concerned, as far as A1 is concerned, and A1 was for 10 marks. We'll now go on and look at A2, explain with suitable calculations how the gain or loss on sale and niche would have been recorded. And in order to do this, we only really need to look at that bit the question. Kutchen had purchased an 80% interest in niche for 40 million when the fair value of the net assets was 44. That, that's enough to actually calculate goodwill there, isn't it? 
the partial goodwill me method had been used to calculate goodwill. So the cost of investment was 40. And if we take 44 million times 80%, so just take that there, 44 million times 80% gives you 35.2 million. The goodwill arising on acquisition is 4.8. And it says it's been impaired by two. So that means unimpaired goodwill is 2.8 million. I think you need to calculate that because when you do the disposal properly, you need to know the unimpaired goodwill. Holding a niche was sold for 50. That's the proceeds. Carrying value in niches identifiable net assets apart from goodwill was 60 million at the date of sale. And the investment's been carried at cost. The director calculated the gain on disposal of two. So what the director has done is gone proceeds of 50 minus 48 million to give two and 48 million is 80 percent of the value of the net assets at the date of disposal which is what has been mentioned in the question my gut tells me that that is wrong because unimpaired goodwill needs to be included in the final gain or loss on disposal calculation as well. So I now think we can go and answer this part of the question. So notice here, I've written a lot less. Well, this is for five marks, not for 10. Don't need to write anywhere near as much. I've done the revised gain or loss on disposal calculation. Proceeds from the question. Percentage of net assets at the date of disposal, given in the question. 60 million was given in the question and we're saying 80%, aren't we, to give us 48. The unimpaired goodwill was 2.8 million. Oh, I've done a calculation for it underneath, which I did on the face of the question anyway, but I've just summarized it in my answer. Okay, so 40 million there is the COI, the cost of investment. 44 million were the net assets at the date of acquisition that we've multiplied by 80% to get 35.2. So goodwill 4.8 minus the impairment gives you 2.8 million. And that 2.8 million is going in the calculation up the top. So the director nearly got this right. Not quite though, they just didn't put the goodwill in. Okay, and then I've done a little bit of explanation underneath. Unimpaired goodwill was omitted, was missed out the original calculation and has now been included. It means we now have a loss on disposal that should go to the statement of profit and loss. So I'm looking at trying to generate five marks for that and I think that will, that will more than do that. Right, that gets us to A3 and A3 requires us to look at that part of the question. Let's just remind ourselves of the requirement again, this bit. Discuss with suitable calculations how the pension scheme should be dealt with. It's actually two parts. There are two issues relating to the pension scheme because there are two locations. After the restructuring of the business segment and whether a provision for restructuring should be made. So we've got quite a lot to do for seven marks here. So let's have a read through. Kuchin has decided to restructure one of its business segments. Plan was agreed by the board of directors on the 1st of October X6, the year end being December. And the plan affects two locations. In the first location, half of the factory units have already been closed. Okay, it's not planned for them to be closed. They've been closed. The employees pension benefits have been frozen. Any new employees will not be eligible to join this defined benefit plan. After the restructuring, the value of the obligation, and the value of the obligation is the value of the scheme liabilities, isn't it? Should be 8 million. Well, at the moment, it's 10. So we're going to need to reduce the value of the scheme obligation down by two. Fair value of the plan assets is seven. Doesn't say anything about those changing. 
so we assume that they don't. The value of the pension liability afterwards, the net liability, will be, um, will be one, won't it? If we're reducing the liability and the assets are staying the same, the net pension liability will be, will be one afterwards. In order to do that, that's not going to be recognising an extra cost though, is it? That's going to be recognising a negative cost, reducing a liability. It costs you to increase a liability. It does the opposite of cost to reduce it. In the second location, all activities have been discontinued. It's not planned that they might do it. They've stopped. It's been agreed that all of the employees will receive a payment of four million in exchange for the pension liability of two million. Hold on, wait a minute. That means that that two that two point four million. Sorry, there. That's not included as part of the ten above. It's a separate liability. As a result of the closure, the pension liability is not big enough, is it? There's going to be an extra one point six million cost expense. So the employees are going to receive, the company is going to pay 4 million to clear a liability of 2.4. There will be an additional expense. Kitchen estimates that the cost of the above restructuring, apart from any pension costs, will be 6 million. But they haven't accounted for the effect of the restructuring because there's been no formal announcement. Well, I would say, so what? And so would IS 37. Even if there isn't a formal announcement, they've started it haven't they? They've started to, to actually implement the plan because it says that some of the units have been closed and it also says all activities in the second location have been discontinued. So is there a past event creating an obligation to pay here? Yeah, the past event is the closure. It's already started and there is a reliable estimate and it is going to happen. So what have I written here? Location one, the pension liability needs to be reduced. It's too high at the moment. This will be shown as a service cost in the SPNL, but it's not actually going to be a cost. It's going to be a negative. It's a negative service cost because what we're doing is we are reducing the pension liability on the SFP by 2 million. And we are increasing the profits or the retained earnings. We're reducing any service cost that has already been charged. Highly likely that this will be classified as a past service cost. And a past service cost is a change to the liability, a change to the pension scheme obligations as a result of something that has just occurred, but it affects previous pension liabilities. So this is a past service cost as opposed to a current one. And it will reduce liabilities and increase profits. So a couple of marks for that, two or three marks for that maybe. Location two, there's a settlement cost. This has actually been ceased, hasn't it? This, this, this pension has been frozen, nothing else happened to it. Creates an additional expense of 1.2 million because the additional scheme liability is only 2.6, but a payment of four is gonna be made. So that is the adjustment that would need to be made. And I could put it in debit credit form because what's happening is the bank is gonna pay out 4 million, 4 million out of your bank account. The pension liability of 2.4 million he says writing 2.6, 2.4 million is going to be extinguished, going to be removed. And you need an extra debit to make it balance of 1.6 million, which is a settlement cost. So we've got a settlement cost or curtailment cost, and we've got a negative service cost. Looking at the third bit, this is all A3. A provision of six million should be made. And I've justified that. Kitchen has already started to implement the plan. They've started to implement it. Therefore, there is a past event. that You can't start a big rock rolling down a hill and then suddenly change your mind and stop it, can you? So there is a past event that results in an obligation to pay. Payment will be made because the activities have already been discontinued. There is a reliable estimate available. So what I haven't actually written there is this is in accordance with IS 37 and a provision needs to be made. The only reason I didn't is because I don't really think that I had time. And then I've, maybe you can argue showed off a little bit at the bottom, but it's just applying your knowledge. Usually restructuring does not qualify as a provision and a board decision alone would not be enough. However, in this case, it's not a board decision alone. There is more than that here. Okay, because of the couple of things that we picked out the question here. 
factory units have been closed. All activities have discontinued there. Okay. Right, so that gets us to the part B. And in order to answer part B, you only need to read that part of the question. So in my planning time and thinking time here, I would have done this. I'd have drawn brackets around the bits of the questions and gone, this is for A1, this is for A2, this is for B and so on. So, you know, you don't have to read the whole thing. It can be really, really daunting if you think you have to read the whole thing. So looking at B, advise Kuchin on the difference between equity and liability and on the proposed accounting treatment of the contingent payments on the subsequent acquisition of the 20% of MAC. Right, remember that MAC is already a subsidiary and it is an 80% subsidiary at the moment, isn't it? So when Kuchin acquired the majority shareholding, there was an option on the remaining 20, the non-controlling interest, which could be exercised any time up to 31st of March X7 and Kuchin acquired, decided to exercise the option and acquired the remaining non-controlling interest on the 31st of January X7. Now, it is not asking you here to talk about the fact that this is now a 100% owned subsidiary and you'd need to deal with the extra 20% um, as an equity adjustment and all that. It's not asking you that. The payment for the NCI. Okay, so already here, what are we asked to do? We're asked to talk about whether this is equity or liability. The payment for the NCI. It's a liability, isn't it, if it's a payment for the non-controlling interest? was structured so that it contained a fixed initial payment and a series of contingent amounts payable over the following two years. Well, the normal rules and regulations relating to contingent payments are that they are measured at fair value. and They are recognised at fair value. The contingent payments were to be based on future profits up to a maximum amount. Kuchin felt that the initial payment was an equity transaction. Well, again, I'd say your basic liability, your basic knowledge should, should tell you that that's probably a liability. Unsure as to what to do with the contingent payments, board discussion, argument, they decided to disclose them. Okay, the base knowledge that I would be using here would be my framework definitions. Of what equity and liability is and I think I'd also perhaps use a little bit of financial instrument knowledge because this we might buy the other 20% later and if we do there will be some payments made sounds like a financial instrument to me so I think that I would use if I could remember it a little bit of my knowledge of IS 32 which talks about initial classification of issued financial instruments and an issued financial instrument is either going to get classified as equity or liability and it's going to be according to substance isn't it according to the economic reality get classified as liability if there's cash going to get paid and it's going to get classified as equity if no cash is going to get paid. In other words, all of the potential future payments or the actual fixed payment that has been made here, it's all liability. It's got to be. So you might look at that part of the question and think, goodness me, I'm not really sure I know much about that. But if you've got your basic knowledge, it will really, really help you. Framework definitions. So this is what I've written. I've started with the conclusion again. It's highly likely that contingent payments will be treated as liabilities. So I've done a bit of application to start with. You could put that at the bottom if you like. I've defined or I've referred to the conceptual framework definition of a liability. And I've also put in the conceptual framework definition of equity as well. So liability, present obligation, transfer benefit as a result of past event. Equity, skipping over the IS32 bit the residual value of the business after the liability has been paid off. And I've also put in all of this stuff here, all of that is K for knowledge. 
isn't it? I haven't applied much. IS32 requires financial instruments to be classified in accordance with their substance rather than their legal form. And I've just sort of restated an equity instrument does not include an obligation to pay cash. And then I've done the A bit, the application bit. The additional 20% is being paid for in cash over a period of time. So it appears to fulfill the framework and the IS32 definition of a liability. The first payment is fixed, it will be paid. Therefore, that is a liability until it's been paid. Um, there's also an element of contingent consideration, which is normally measured at fair value if it's part of the cost of an acquisition, which is what it is here, isn't it? It's part of the cost of an acquisition, acquiring the extra 20%. Therefore, the current disclosure of these amounts is insufficient. It's not enough. They should include a provision. This is a this is a pet hate of mine. OK, if you say you are going to recognize. In this case, you are recognize you should recognize a provision. You should recognize a provision for the contingent consideration. There is a difference between a recognition and a disclosure. A disclosure is where you explain something in the financial statements and refer to some numbers. Recognition is a debit credit double entry that has a direct impact on the numerical information. So disclosure is not enough. Recognition is required. What I've also done, and I really like doing this, it will get you marks and it's easy. I have referred to whether or not I think that the current treatment is ethical. Now, sometimes you're asked to do this, but on other occasions you just can. And I think it's a really, really good thing to be able to do just in case you haven't got enough to say. So the desire to treat as equity and not recognize the contingent element at all. So treat the initial transaction as equity and not recognize the contingent element could be because the directors are trying to hide transactions because they lack integrity, they're not being honest. Or it could be because they don't know what they're doing because they're demonstrating a lack of professional competence. Either way, that would make it unethical, wouldn't it? Because you know that the ACCA code of conduct, the ethical framework includes some fundamental ethical principles. I'm just writing prof for professional. The fundamental ethical principles are as follows, aren't they? Integrity, objectivity, professional competence, confidentiality, and professional behavior. And I'm saying here, if they're trying to hide something, it's a lack of integrity. If they don't know what they're doing, it's a lack of competence. It doesn't really matter which one it is. They're both unethical. You're going to see common themes running through a lot of the debriefs that I do, a lot of the question debriefs that I'm doing for APC. Um, and the common themes are there's a lot of knowledge that you can use and there's a lot of marks you can get by using your framework knowledge. So the definition of elements of the financial statements, the characteristics of information, that kind of thing. There are also going to be quite a lot of marks you can get by applying your ethical code of conduct as well. Now, there might, not, might, might not be many in this particular question, but there are a lot in a lot of questions. OK, that concludes the debrief for question one of specimen paper one. I hope it's been useful.